right? Is the mic working okay? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Momin. I'm delighted to be with you here today. The talk, the title of my talk, is coming from George Box's famous quote, all models are wrong. And I want to bring that up. This is from 1979 uh, to make two points. The first is that it's very well said. The other is that this is nothing new. Uh, people have been talking for decades, not centuries, but decades about how the models we use to understand the world uh, are not ever the reflection of the world itself. There's this famous quote from 1933, the map is not the territory. And in fact, if the map were the territory, it would be useless. The point of models is that they abstract some essential part of the system and deciding what's essential and deciding what's not and what we lose is really the art of modeling. And that doesn't go away, no matter how much data we have, no matter how fancy our models are. And that's what this talk is about. So I don't know if you could see the, the faded out part, but um, yeah, the, the rest of the quote is, some are useful. And it's about determining what we want to do and what is useful. Uh, there's this beautiful picture that this is uh, both Twitter and Flickr geotags visualized over a map of Europe. But actually, there's no geographic information other than the latitude and longitude. And yet, we perfectly see the outlines of cities, of coastlines, of roads, of urban centers. Uh, and this uh, is kind of the, the hopes behind digital trace data. The 2009 Editorial Computational Social Science that some people from Northwestern were also here on talks about, talks about how we regularly uh, perform all these actions, checking emails, making calls, posting blog entries, uh, having online social networks. Each of these leaves a digital trace. And the hope behind pictures like this and the kind of imagination it's suggested is that we can use this to completely transform what we understand about people and society. The flip side of that, um, how many people have seen some version of this going around online in the past two, three days? Um, I think the audio is down, but you can hear the, the squeaking cart. This uh, digital artist, he took 99 smartphones, put them in this squeaky red wagon, uh, turned them all to Google Maps, and walked around Berlin. He also walked around the Google offices. All of this gets red when he walks by. So, you know, Google has a traffic jam on this empty street uh, outside its offices. The point, I mean, this is, this is a fun little thing talking about reliance of technology, but this really does show larger themes, that a lot of what we use are proxy for what we care about. Google Maps being open is not a car, but in a lot of cases, it's a very reliable proxy for traffic, and Google use, uses that. But as long as a proxy is never the thing itself, as long as the map is not the territory, there will be some way, some time when it will fail. And thinking through that and thinking how models have the same problems uh, can help us be more robust in what we do in modeling. To go back to Box, again, it's trivial to say, is a model true if it's the whole truth? No, they're never true. They're not the thing itself. So we have to ask, what are they useful for? And what that article is about, about robustness and strategy of scientific model building, is what happens when it's wrong? How can we make it robust to some of these failures of assumptions? The title of this talk in my research is When, How Data and Models Are Wrong. Uh, when and how it matters, a lot of times it doesn't matter, and what we can do to address those limitations. The outline, and you can also follow uh, along on the left side, so that you don't have to write down any references. Uh, the PDFs of the slides are posted at myname.com slash nico2020.pdf. So you don't have to worry about copying anything down. Uh, and you can follow along on the left side. So I already had a fantastic introduction, but I've gone through um, many different programs, disciplines, and training, and that's what I try to bring together in my work. Uh, summarizing my dissertation in one meme, it was about uh, data not really meaning what people think it means, specifically around digital trace data. I'll be presenting some of that work and also talking about some of my current work, more focusing on models and the assumptions that they're making and how that matters and things that people have not recognized. Um, I did some applied work, too, as part of the Data Science and Social Good Summer Fellowship. And now I'm back at the Berkman Klein Center, where I previously worked, first getting interested in some of these issues. The first project uh, is a while back. It's from 2015, but I think it's still very relevant. And it started off, well, with the obligatory XKCD cartoon. Um, 
consumers of furry pornography, subscribers to Martha Stewart Living and our site's users look very, very similar. Uh, and the, the lesson is that all maps are maps of population density, or it's very rare that if you plot a map, it's something more than population density. But as I showed in that map in the beginning, what if that's actually true? What if it's really population density? These are plots from Twitter about geotag tweets. Again, amazing, amazing detail about levels of activity, about roads, about coastlines. Um, if it really were the case that geotag tweets were population density, that would be a really useful and powerful tool to have way more resolution than the census. And this was motivated partially by seeing people claim, hey, we can use geotag tweets to study public health, infectious disease transmission, uh, food poisoning, urban planning, transportation, disaster relief. We can all do all these fantastic things. Um, but some of the social science background I draw on is very basic sociology. Uh, what are the biases in the data? What is represented? What is left out? And so that's what I set out to investigate. Can you actually link these two things? Uh, I want to take a poll. One of these maps is geotag tweets and another is population. How many people think the map on the left is population? And how many people think the map on the right is population? So about evenly split. Does anybody want to offer why they, they think what they think? Spread between what you think are urban centers, so it might be people moving. Um, That is actually a very good observation as well. Um, so the resolution is also not perfect. Uh, so if you made a mistake, you can blame it on that. The, the best signature I found is that roads show up again in better resolution, much more clearly in the geotag tweets. People don't live along roads, but hopefully not the drivers. They do tweet along roads. Um, that's a very apt uh, thing that I didn't pick up. There's way more geotag tweets around the Bay Area then there is population, proportionately by population. So if you were to just run a correlation of pixels, and people have done this, it's pretty good. It's 98%. But depending on what we want to use it for, that may not be good enough. What I try to do, and that's the answer left, is geotag tweets right or the population. So what I try to do is say, well, what would it look like to test if geotag tweets and the population really are the same thing? Making a sort of toy model, we can say, OK, let's say that's some proportion. Um, the users of geotag tweets are you, the population is uh, P, and then there's some coefficient that's the, the scale. And then we can also have heteroscedastic errors, so it's proportional to how many people are there. Um, do a little algebra, and then you can compare it to a linear model. The idea is that you want to test. If beta 1 is equal to 1, then indeed geotag tweets are a random enough sample of the population. And in fact, if we exponentiate this, it'll be that proportion. To show what a kind of instantiation of this, we can look at the number of males per population. Uh, it fits really well. The slope is absolutely one. And the intercept is down here at about uh, negative 0.3. If you exponentiate that, you get 0.46. That is indeed the average proportion of males per block group in the United States. So as a null model, this works really well for saying, OK, what's about evenly distributed? Uh, by the way, does anybody want to guess what these are here that have far fewer men per population? Women's prisons. Um, these are census categories. And this actually does form a very nice uh, log normal distribution. So they designed them to be that way. Uh, but there are block groups that are just airports, just bodies of water, or just prisons. And you do have, that's partially the way I did it. Um, the top is constrained up here. But there are men's prisons as well. Women's prisons are, are block groups all into themselves that have more women than men by a lot. Um, but if we were to apply the same model and try geotag tweets, it's a complete mess. It looks nothing like that. So OK, it's kind of hard to say. It's much more randomly distributed. It's not a perfect you know, bivariate log uh, normal uh, distribution, but it's something close to that. And from a first pass, we should say, OK, we should definitely not get rid of the census and start using geotag tweets. Um, but we can go further and say, OK, let's do a little bit more modeling. That, that was just a, a simple hypothesis test. We can apply some spatial modeling, control for spatial autocorrelations. 
and start to model this in a traditional social science way, using the census as kind of the, the ground truth in this case. Uh, look at urban centers, look at east and west coast, look at you know, north and south. Uh, these are the kinds of patterns you see. There are fewer people using geotag tweets where you'd expect in rural places, uh, places with a lot of poor elderly populations and non-coastal. Uh, I think you find way more on the west coast than you would expect and on both coasts. So I fit both a, a linear and a, um, a quadratic term and you get the, the coasts and especially the west coast coming out. Some things are surprising. So um, block groups with higher populations of uh, Asian, the census group is Hispanic, and black populations have more geotag tweets. And there is uh, maybe some correlations between higher populations in California, uh, but also there's a lot of work around black Twitter about it being a space where people organize and have their own internal communities. And so that could be showing up in a large scale way as well. And this is uh, only model, able to model some things. Uh, a colleague of mine who did qualitative work on um, Twitter users in Texas who tweeted out in support of uh, Wendy, I'm forgetting her last name, but she was uh, a politician who was supporting abortion rights. And uh, my colleague pointed out that a lot of women stopped tagging their tweets with geotags because they were getting harassment and stalking. So there are all these other things I can't even measure gender because that's uh, not something I can measure in tweets to compare with the census, but these are the kind of things we would expect to see less of. We have to think of the conditions under which people are tweeting. Um, a really great example of this mattering is geotag tweets for Hurricane Sandy. This is a, a paper from a few geographers. So a lot of the computer science literature will, um, at least a while ago, I think it's getting a lot better now, uh, will plot tweets and where things were. Right? This is a sort of confirmation um, bias problem. Indeed, where there were a lot of tweets, there were problems, floods and power, uh, floods, power loss, delays. But if you were to flip that around and say, okay, where were the most deaths uh, and compare that to geotag tweets? Well, actually, most of Sandy related deaths were in Staten Island where there's almost no geotag tweet activity. So um, I see papers occasionally citing mine and I go and look at them and I was very disheartened to see one a couple of days ago that cited it and did the exact thing that I said not to do. They said, look, geotag tweets can do all of these things. And that's the point, no, they can't. You should be really careful about why people are tweeting, who's tweeting, uh, before you want to use them for things that lives depend on. Um, what are the responses to this? So I think doing this old sociology work of waiting, of uh, calibration, of sampling, is, is still useful and still needed. These don't replace some of the older things that were developed around survey research. They just need to be ported into this new realm. Uh, I think theory is really important. A paper I really like talks about how geotag tweets are postcards, not ticket stubs. So would you study a record of where people have been based on postcards? Maybe not. People like to brag about where they've been. We saw a lot of geotag tweets from airports, people saying they've arrived, they've landed, uh, which is not necessarily a good trace of where all they've been. Uh, and I think it's also possible to find clever study designs. Uh, David Lazar's group at Northeastern has spent a lot of time assembling a panel of people and then following their tweets so that they know what the demographics are. I reviewed a paper that looked at a Swedish panel study where people kept travel diaries and looking at the aggregate patterns of those two people who reside in Sweden and their uh, travel behavior. So these are the types of comparisons that we can look for and try to do. The next one is what I call platform effects. So there's... Um, have you ever know the Netflix, Netflix Prize? So Netflix, this is one of the early big data competitions, machine learning competitions, um, getting a bunch of people to submit uh, classifiers or predictions for what movies people would like. And one of the winners had this very interesting plot in his paper. This is the average ratings, this is per day. So this is about um, a few years in, in, in early 2004. Movies got a lot better in early 2004. <laughs> That's amazing, right? Well, of, of course not. Um, this wasn't well documented, but uh, Yehuda Korin speculated that maybe they changed the wording of the ratings, maybe from great movie to I loved it, something like that, right? And we do indeed know from survey research that the way you word responses can change the distribution of how people give them. From the perspective of machine learning, as long as you just shift these up so they're comparable um, to ratings in the future, you can still use them. Uh, but from a social science perspective, the bigger question is, what are we measuring? 
And the thing to note about social media data, social media platforms, is that they're not research utilities. They are businesses. They want to make money. They want to build their platforms so that people do the things that get them more advertising revenue, more activity, whatever it is that they're trying to optimize. Um, one big thing that a lot of sites do is try to grow their users' networks. Uh, LinkedIn has a people you may know feature. Twitter has who to follow. And Facebook has people you may know as well. How is this done? Um, you know, informally, we in computational social science find out that most of these are done by triadic closure, a uh, friend of a friend. The more friends you have in common with somebody, the more likely it is that you are indeed connected to them. And indeed, you can see the counts, 10 mutual friends, six, and that's how they're, they're ranked. As time goes on, they incorporate other things, but that's a driving factor in a lot of these recommender systems. Um, and again, we can start to ask, when we're doing computational social science with data from sources like this, what are we really measuring? Are we just measuring the success of a recommender system or something about people's behavior? How do we disentangle the two? Uh, does everybody remember the matrix? So the idea that, hey, you see this cat deja vu, it's a glitch in the matrix. Uh, that tells you something's about to happen. And I think we can start to think about and use data artifacts as forms of natural experiment. Uh, regression discontinuity design, interrupted time series. These are ideas from econometrics especially that if all things being equal, um, there's some interruption, you can use that interruption as measurement of a causal effect. Do you never really know what hap would have happened before the counterfactual or what would have happened after had the intervention not happened? But you can uh, measure the local average treatment effect, which is a useful way to get a sense of what the causal impact was. And there's now causal inference work on recommender systems that this ties into as well. Uh, there's a fantastic data set that happened to be collected while it was still possible uh, from the New Orleans Facebook network. And they collected it from um, around 2006 through 2009. Then it became impossible because they shut down the API. But as a couple of papers noted as a curiosity, there was this spike. Right? Something happened right around um, kind of early 2008. And people looked and they realized, oh, this is when people you may know was introduced. So this is exactly the type of natural experiment that is perfect that we may not get another chance to do in a lot of other cases. And we can look at different um, plots. This is the daily added triangles, change in transitivity, uh, change in density. And we can model that. Here it's really the setup. Once you have the setup, it's you just run kind of a, a meaningful model. This is uh, tolerance intervals to account for autocorrelation. And you can measure how much this recommender system impacted this network. It had a huge impact. All of a sudden, there are way, way, way more edges. Not only that, but the kind of edges that were being created were edges that were closing a lot of triangles versus the edges that were being added before. There's a critical sociology paper from Kieran Healy who says, uh, you know, when Facebook implements this system based on the assumption that people connect, is it really that that's what's happening or are they just giving people the opportunity to click a button and thus getting a network that looks like they think it should look like, right? And so this is what sorts of manipulations are taking place that are not meant to be manipulations, but they do change what we think we're observing in the network. And if computational social science studies, especially big data studies are not taking these processes into account, they may not generalize not to other platforms that may not have recommender systems like this, and not to social networks in general, whatever that might mean. Um, and I think the, the larger point is also that a Facebook friendship is not actually a friendship. And I see people making this mistake. Everybody's like, it's absolutely true. You know, I'm friends with people that I don't like. Uh, I'm not friends with people who I do like, mainly because they're not on Facebook. Uh, there was a, a sensor study that, for example, used Facebook friends as its ground truth to validate sensor measurements. That's not really what you want. Uh, friendship is a really complicated thing, and it's really easy to measure a Facebook friendship, but that's not really a friendship. So if you make conclusions about Facebook ties, it's not the same as having learned about friendship. Um, but I think this shows that we can look for cases where platforms change things, and from the outside, reverse engineer what's going on. Uh, there were cases where, in the case of my first study, some point a few years after, uh, Twitter changed the default geotagged option so that it didn't provide latitude and longitude, but instead only provided this general city area. And that was because of concerns about privacy. All of a sudden, the number of geotagged tweets dropped precipitously. So it wasn't really that people wanted to volunteer latitude and longitude. They just wanted to volunteer geographic information and went with the default. 
So that tells us something about what people really wanted to share and how they were sharing it. They weren't concerned about precision, but just saying that they were in a particular place. Um, the larger theme, so this is a lot from my dissertation work. Uh, there's a lot of work on data, and this goes back to 2011. There's both theoretical and empirical work, uh, critical questions for big data. Don't turn social media into another literary digest poll. This is when um, literary digest called people with phone lines, overwhelmingly re Republican, uh, predicted a Republican landslide when in fact it was a Democratic landslide in 1930. Big embarrassment for survey research and an example that people later cited for saying random sampling is better than an N of a million, which is what literary digest had. Um, big questions for social media data. Uh, social media for large studies of behavior with another survey kind of analogy, Dewey defeats Truman. Chicago Tribune, again, conservative, or Republican leaning, uh, they rushed to publish. And that's maybe a lesson about social media data as well. And they were wrong. Here's Truman who defeated Dewey triumphantly and mockingly holding up the, the front page of the newspaper. Um, parable of Google flu, traps in big data analysis. Right, Google flu was supposed to be this wondrous system that would have real time uh, before the CDC could know when there was flu to know where it was from search results. Failed spectacularly. Uh, and there are lots of lessons we can draw from that and some of those are discussed in this article. Um, big data and the danger of being precisely inaccurate. Possibilities and perils. Is bigger always better? Weapons of math destruction, bias on the web. So there's a lot. Um, and if you only need one thing, I would recommend this. I was a reviewer on it, and like the two dozen references that it didn't already have, I suggested. So this is everything up to 2019 about social media data, uh, all of the ways in which it can be biased and misleading. Um, but the things that I saw weren't really being discussed as much were some of this work that happened in statistics, especially in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, about how models also embody these assumptions and are wrong. The work that I'm doing right now, and I have a preprint, hopefully coming out on archive at some point, um, but on my website until then, uh, trade-offs in different types of modeling and in even types of research. So remembering all models are wrong, this is kind of my working model of decisions that we make when we're doing research. Uh, and at each of these branches, when we decide to go one way and not another, there are trade-offs and nothing is intrinsically better than the other. Uh, and I think what we tend to forget, especially when certain disciplines really specialize in one of these branches, one of these endpoints, is that other options exist. So um, computer scientist Hannah Wallach has a great piece, computer, computational social science does not equal uh, social data plus computer science, where she talks candidly about realizing that machine learning is not the be all and end all of every solution. Right? You have um, people who do simulation modeling who kind of don't want the dirtiness of data in some cases. I know that's a minority, but just as an example. Uh, and I think a lot of pe people in quantitative disciplines tend to completely forget that qualitative analysis exists. Uh, speaking of you know, Northwestern, I have a vivid memory of uh, Dr. Amaral here giving a talk about his own research in, I wanna say 2013. And he said, if only I could have been a fly on the wall when people were discussing scientific collaborations. And my thought was, well, people do that work. They go, they talk to people, and they work out what they're thinking, what they're feeling, all of the complexity that happens that's not captured necessarily in just a co-authorship tie. So these are options, they exist, and depending on what we want to do, that might be the right approach. And I'll be getting a bit more into that. Um, the specific branch that I go down in the draft and then I'll go down here is the one that ends up in machine learning. Uh, I won't be talking too much about some of the trade-offs that happen if we were to go down some of these other branches, but you can check out the draft for that or talk to me about it. And I have strong opinions and I'd love to get people's opinions if you identify with you know, doing social physics or something like that. Um, so yeah, quantification affects everything below. Uh, if you rely on probability, that affects everything below. So this is the sense in which it's a hierarchy. The, the problems propagate throughout it. The first thing is quantification. Uh, and we tend to not even think about it. We use the data that we're given that's available. We use what is measurable. But this is a huge decision that we're making. Uh, qualitative research, and this is not something I do, but I respect enormously, is able to get at something like friendship not being the same for everybody. It's multifaceted, it's heterogeneous, it's intersubjective, it changes across time and place and even individual people across time. Right, and qualitative research can get into that and can sort of wrestle with that. 
Whereas if you have a survey, if you have some instrumentalization, some measurement, you lock in one sense of friendship and you become, uh, when you're doing analysis, kind of at the mercy of that. When you end up using something like a survey, something like a digital trace, it's usually a proxy for the thing that you really care about as a human being. And you are really at the mercy of that. Um, that suggests mixed methods, especially thinking about how you're doing the quantification, where it can fail is one way to start to get around this. Uh, something that I think people don't talk about enough or reflect about enough is this idea of a central tendency. So statistics and machine learning, unlike kind of more social physics style modeling, unlike sometimes agent-based modeling, um, need multiple observations. They are fundamentally unable to do anything with an N of one. Um, the benefit or what they gain from this is that they can both take in data directly and they can account for variability. So they can have a sense that there is some signal and things won't exactly match that signal, right? There'll be some distribution around that, but that doesn't mean that there isn't still that signal. Um, central tendency is the key with things. So for a lot of things, it's the mean. It might also be the median. It might be the majority class if you have a discrete problem. But that's how machine learning and statistics do things. Um, and it's important to remember that this was, especially in the 1800s, really weird for people, right? This idea of l'homme moyen, the average man, who's average in arm span and height and intelligence. This is a totally fictitious creature. How are you planning out your governance decisions based on this totally arbitrary hypothetical entity, right? So this struck people as really weird. Um, the other thing that I'll also deal with later is independence assumptions. That's also gonna be a, a big part that we have to do. If all data points are related to one another, we have an N of one and we can't do anything. So we have to assume certain forms of independence. Um, going down now, so I really like this distinction between statistics and machine learning being phrased in terms of prediction and explanation. Uh, there's a fantastic piece by Leo Breiman from 2001, historically very important, but still philosophically, I think, informative today. He says, hey, statisticians, there's this new field called machine learning. They're doing all this stuff where they're not obsessing about the data generating process. They're just making algorithms that can take in data and output a reliable answer. And you should get with the program, otherwise you're gonna be obsolete. 2001, and that kind of did play out in many ways. So it's, it's instructive to look at that in retrospect. Um, the problem with that, and maybe it's swung too much in the direction of prediction. Predictions are defined in a really weird way. And if there's anybody who has a background in physics, uh, who interacts with machine learning, you might have come across this. Um, prediction is purely retrospective correlation. And that's not the way it's necessarily defined. So I read physics books and their predictions are always the outcome of an experiment, right? Some sort of manipulation. Uh, Milton Friedman, whatever you think of his politics, had a big influence on economics. In essays on positive economics, he says, the thing that matters is prediction in the presence of change, right? Which is manipulation. You can't just post hoc say that if everything stays the same, I predicted, that's not what matters. What matters is understanding how if I change some inputs, how the outputs will vary. Um, correlations are what minimize loss. And that's kind of a consequence of the way loss functions are written down, that it will be correlations that match central tendencies. And the thing that I take away most strongly from Google flu trends is that things that are not causal, so for example, the correlation of flu and winter related search terms can predict really well in a lot of cases, um, but they can fail. If we don't understand the underlying mechanism, we don't know when non-causal correlations will fail to be reliable. Uh, machine learning has a lot of ways of talking about this concept drift, uh, distribution shift, uh, but I think the way to think about it is understanding what Leo Breiman was saying, statisticians worry too much about the data generating process or some sort of underlying causal process. Machine learning is great and a lot of modern non-parametric statistics are great in not making assumptions, uh, but there are drawbacks from that. And that's the important thing to remember and keep in mind. So one thing in particular that prediction, and this applies to other things up the hierarchy, but specifically for machine learning, constructs. Uh, so this is a typical setup of a supervised learning problem you could have a whole lot of other nodes, but you have some features that produce the ground truth. The directionality is not actually important just so long as they're correlated. So a detection problem, the ground truth produces the features. But what actually happens in a lot of cases is that there's some underlying construct that's the thing we really care about 
that produces what's labeled as ground truth and then the features. Um, constructs are, I think of them as the sort of primitive of social science. That's things like friendship, like happiness, like well-being, these really diffuse concepts that we want to operationalize and measure. Um, they're often unobservable and like friendship, hypothetical and subjective. So we need to come up with ways of saying, okay, we're measuring this, does it do what we want it to do? And there are a whole bunch of ways, uh, validity, uh, construct validity, external validity, internal validity, and you can read all about those, by which we establish whether a construct is being well measured by the measurement we use, even if we can't really measure the underlying. Google Maps usage is not traffic, it's a proxy. It's the underlying construct is traffic. That can be directly observed, probably by observers, uh, and that's probably how Google correlated the Google Maps things early on enough. But every proxy can fail, and understanding what the link is, how the construct links to the ground truth, can also help understand where it will go wrong. Specific example of this, uh, neural nets. And people like to say, wow, performance is so fantastic. This is like nothing before. And it is really fantastic. Uh, neural nets in particular can both optimize the correlations and how to even extract uh, groupings of pixels that correlate with human labels. But what's really happening is it's not the human label cat that's a cat. It's some underlying notion of we look at a picture and say this is a cat, and then you get people to laboriously go through thousands of images for a cent each to label cat. And then we put that in with these um, you know, convolutional networks that find how to slice and dice the image to get these things that correlate. A quick poll again. How many people would label that as a cat? One person, okay, not bad. Um, two people, how many people would label this as a cat? How about now? Right, so it's what do we care about? There is no true construct of catness, it's what do we want it to do? Uh, I mean, you probably guessed that both of these are trick questions. If we care about phylogeny, then that's a false saber-toothed cat. It was an example of convergent evolution. And this is a reconstruction of it. Um, it looks a lot like the things that were in the family of felines, but it's not, it's just a related branch. But if we want a picture of a cat, you know, you might not be able to distinguish that from a saber-toothed tiger. Alternatively, if we care about phylogeny, and we might say that, hey, it really matters that there's a cat in the picture, but if you're searching on Google Images for cat, hidden cat, maybe you'd find that, but just cat, you may not want that. So this is the, the notion in which a construct really depends on what we want to get out of it. There's no true meaning of friendship, despite movies from Hallmark, um, that we have to define what we care about, what we mean by it. And that's something that I think machine learning can adopt. Uh, again, identify, define what the underlying construct is. Understand how the correlations are working. So I was really excited when I saw adversarial examples of um, neural networks. Because for me, that's the perfect illustration. These are correlations. You can fool any proxy. By adding imperceptible noise, imperceptible to a human, uh, you can make any image be reclassified by standard performers, performance classifiers as anything. You can even 3D print objects so that a turtle, what looks like a turtle, is a gun, right? Or vice versa. Uh, you can have a stop sign, put some smudges on it, and it's read as a 45 uh, per hour, mile per hour limit. So some really potentially dangerous things. And of course, so long as the proxy, so long as these patterns of pixels are not the construct itself, uh, that will always be able to happen. So we need to think very carefully about what sort of systems we adopt and reify. Um, one use I really agree with for machine learning is sort of scaling up human labels, getting some people who are domain experts to code a set of tweets or articles, uh, and then using something like n-grams and a random forest to scale up. And um, in the draft, I have other examples that I think are positive examples of where machine learning really is the right tool for the job, where we don't need to know about the causal underlying structure, um, either because we can't measure it or we don't care. Yeah. Yes, please.
Yes. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who have a ideological kind of dogmatic hope, faith, belief that yes, uh, there's a book called Master Algorithm, right? And that's why I also like to talk about models, not algorithms. Would we ever say the universal model? Maybe in physics we, we want to, but certainly not in social science. Um, yeah, a lot of information is not in the lost landscape of any gradient you could get out of a group of pixels. Of course, it's really hard to say that categorically, there's no feature extraction, no way of twisting the data that you couldn't do it. But just from social science theory, I think there's no sense in which contextual information of a lot of kinds is in pixels or in any way you could get out of that. I have a colleague who's working on that more formally that I'm excited to see forthcoming. So Bo Sievers, uh, and he's also looking at generalizability, uh, overfitting some of these issues in a really fundamental level. So I think that's work happening, but he finds a lot of resistance. He's also coming more out of cognitive science and psychology. Uh, and there he talks about people really wanting to believe that neural nets are the right model for human vision and even cognition. Uh, and he's finding that that's not the case. So, yeah. Um, there, there are other limits, and I'll, I'll get to one specific case that I think people haven't talked about enough, but that's, that's one thing about what feature extractions can, are there things that they can never recover? And I think there are. Uh, and that's okay because no model will do everything. No approach will do everything. Um, yeah. So dependencies and cross-validation, that's the specific thing I, I'd like to address. So the, the last branch of this is how machine learning models are validated. There's a nice philosophy of science book from 1998, um, an introduction to the theory of forecasting, that talks about every prediction entailing a meta-prediction, which is, do I predict the prediction will hold? And then you can say, do I predict my prediction of the prediction will hold at infinitum? It says, at least two levels out, that's a worthwhile exercise. Um, in machine learning, the way their predictions are evaluated is cross-validation. Uh, so that's their meta-prediction, but we should go one level higher and say, does cross-validation work? When does it fail? When does it not hold? So I know not everybody will be familiar with this, but especially statistical non-parametric models as well, and a lot of machine learning models, you don't specify the family of functional forms. You leave it totally open for fitting to a curve, fitting a decision boundary or decision threshold. Uh, the problem with that is that you can very easily overfit. You can just connect every line. And that just empirically doesn't generalize well. So the thing that machine learning, taking from statistics, figured out is that if you split the data into two parts, a training set and a test set, uh, the signal should be the same on these two sets, but the noise should be independent. And then, indeed, if you fit something that's optimal on the training set, um, but not optimal on the test set, you'll find if you've overfitted, and that's a way to control that. Um, this is the most math slide that I will have, uh, so if you don't follow, don't worry too much about this, but there's this classic argument in machine learning, um, kind of all statistical machine learning courses, about the bias variance decomposition. And again, the way loss is defined, the way predictions are defined, mean squared error is a convenient form to manipulate. Uh, so we say that you predict well if your, um, if your model, y hat, your predicted values are close to the true, possibly unobserved values. You can split this up. You can do some fancy matrix algebra, add in all these terms, cancel all these out, and you get this identity. You have this term, the trace of the variance of y, um, the true kind of mean minus the expectation of your model, the variance of your model and this kind of weird covariance term. And these are fancifully called the Bayes error or the irreducible error. And that's just the amount of uncertainty there is in the world. You can never get beyond that. Uh, whether your model is biased, whether it fits the true, again, potentially unknown function, or whether it departs from that. And nothing to do with the true signal, nothing to do with uh, mu or y, is the variance of the estimator. And last, uh, there's something called the optimism, and I'll, I'll get a little bit into that in a second. But the idea behind the bias variance trade-off is that you can have a model that's biased, but if you regularize it, if you decrease the variance of the model, you will actually get lower mean squared error. And that's the, the kind of starting point for a lot of machine learning. We don't care about unbiased estimators anymore. We can use some regularization to get better answers, even if the coefficients that we get out, the innards of the model, 
are not as reliable for getting information about the system. And that's, I think, also a big philosophical shift between statistics and machine learning. Um, I want to draw back to something I was saying before. If we were to define prediction as prediction in the presence of change, the bias variance trade-off might not hold. Because then, really, an unbiased estimator would be the one that would be correct if you change something about the, the underlying system. Uh, the thing about the optimism. So this covariance term, if the new data is independent of the model, then this term is zero. The covariance is zero. The problem is if you're, test, if you're testing on the same data you used to make the model, then you'll be overly optimistic. So this term is negative. It'll make you think you're doing better than you really are. So what you do is you split the data into a training set and a test set, and that makes this term go to zero if they're independent. So um, this is something that pops up in a lot of cases, but I'm trying to kind of have a unified treatment. Again, this is some math. Uh, have two copies of the features and kind of two independent outputs where everything is correlated with rho. Uh, you have sigma squared in the diagonal, everything else is rho sigma squared. Then you can calculate the optimism of the training set that's you know, a function of the, the trace matrix and the irreducible error. But also, if you split the data and use y1 as training, y2 as test, you still get optimism. Concrete examples of this, or a more simulation example, is uh, I just you know, have a random curve I'm simulating from it. If you split the training and the test data from a multivariate normal, the training and test data are going to be correlated and potentially far from an independent draw, a truly independent draw. And if you look at the expected error over multiple simulations, training error is low, test error is a bit higher, but the true out-of-sample error can be enormous. Um, and so the way I'm kind of conceptualizing this is statistics cares a lot about dependencies, right? If you have dependent data, you can have model misspecification, omitted variable bias, deflated standard errors, right? Wrong inferences. Machine learning, even though it has a lot in statistical relational learning, probabilistic graphical models, I haven't found anything in those talking about how to split your data to respect dependencies. Um, if you, you know, calculate the theoretical quantities, they match very well with the simulation. So I'm pretty sure this all works out. Uh, time series. That's one place where people have learned, hey, I shouldn't do random things. I shouldn't take points from the future to train my model and then test on points in the past. That's time traveling. You know, great performance doesn't generalize at all. Um, activity recognition. If you are just randomizing all of your observations, you're not going to get a very good uh, picture of how well your, your model performs. You really should leave one subject out, and that better captures the kind of variance that happens between an individual person's um, activities. Um, and I think some of this is necessary to get better machine learning estimates of performance, uh, but we still should, in many cases, care about what the underlying causal process is, uh, and even care about what the underlying measurement process is and where things can go wrong. Um, the responses to this, I think, are, well, have better cross-validation schemes. For networks, there's really only a couple of things that have started to come out around network cross-validation. Uh, but if you split a network, just cut off some edges, the edges that you leave out still share information between the training and test sets. And you should keep that in mind, that you're going to be overly optimistic even with cross-validation. Uh, but I really think experiments and out-of-sample testing are the best way to assess the performance of a classifier. I think in many cases, reproducibility is not worth the cost in terms of not being able to do a lot of really interesting research. Um, but we should also just change the way we talk about that. I think that prediction means too many things to too many people. Uh, a lot of people take it to mean like prophecy. So, and this is not the fault of anybody today. In 1928, I find Pearson talking about prediction in a kind of modern sense. Uh, but maybe we should talk about retrodiction. Uh, we should talk about backtesting. Uh, or maybe even just correlation, because prediction imbues this kind of prophetic metaphysical sense to what's happening. And I think that's a unique danger when somebody says expected value. You know, I don't think it has that same force of having a metaphor for the, you know, first moment of a probability distribution. Prediction is special, though. It's, it's a metaphor, but it does some actual damage, I think, out in the world when we're trying to communicate. So discussion and conclusion. Um, some of the larger themes. I talked a little bit about my background, but uh, the larger theory that I'm drawing from is this idea that there's always something that you can challenge about a model, right? If I were to do an experiment and I say I've disproven, you know, who is a Rutherford's gold foil experiment, I would not believe it, right? I would say I probably did something wrong. 
So there's a lot of layers in terms of what we believe that's not just the data, the modeling. There's this amazing um, study from Z Silberizad et al. that gives the same data set, same question to 29 teams. They all come up with a different model. So they get kind of convergent results, which is, which is um, you know, reassuring, but it's still, there's enormous variability in the decisions we make. Andrew Gelman calls this the garden of forking paths. Um, and we should think about this, even when we do like the result, even when it does agree with what we do. Um, uh, George Box again says, this road is endless. We can keep making our models more and more complicated and that, you know, it's, it'll always be something more. But what I do is I read ethnography, I read qualitative work, theoretical work, critical work, and that guides the kind of questions I ask. So some of the geotag tweet stuff came out of geographic studies of um, biases in urban versus rural areas and thinking about that, about who's left out. There was this app in Boston for detecting potholes um, that people would install the app, drive over a pothole, take a picture, mark it. All the potholes were in rich areas. Are they actually all in rich areas? No, people weren't downloading this in the, in the poor areas. So these types of biases and in terms of playing out by existing power structures is the kind of thing that I think about when I'm trying to decide what to study. And that's how I make the road um, end. And I think one of the things that I, I got from studying social science is people who use data and models not as what embodies the understanding of the world, but just a reflection of it. They express their ultimately qualitative theoretical understandings as models as fitted you know, parameters. Um, but that was always subject to this underlying notion that they had. And divorcing those two, I think, is where we start getting into trouble when people, again, this is happening less now, take social media data, put it through a classifier and think that this tells them something about the world. Maybe it does, but more likely than not, uh, there's something that can go horribly wrong. The work um, that remains to be done, I think that there's still a lot of work to do we should know by this point what kind of biases there are. And some of the books and articles I showed before will point the way to that. But there's still work to be done. You know, if we do want to use geotag tweets as a uh, public health monitoring tool, that's a worthwhile thing. But we should measure how it's biased and be prepared that something Twitter changes and that changes our entire system. Um, training is a big part of this. A lot of this is me just reading old stats papers that aren't part of machine learning curricula. And I think a lot of these can be incorporated and links can be made because a lot of the earlier um, objectives are not what machine learning is trying to do, but the themes carry across. P-hacking doesn't happen if you don't have p-values in machine learning, but you can still selectively publish results, right? You can just keep trying new classifiers again and again. Kaggle is a great example of this. People overfit to the test data. That's why Kaggle has a private leaderboard and a public leaderboard. And indeed, people find themselves dropping hundreds of places when the final results are released. They were top of the public leaderboard, the private leaderboard, and they're in the hundreds. So, you know, all these things happen and thinking about how we can incorporate them into training and just people being aware of them so they don't complain on Kaggle forums uh, would be a big way forward. And I think mixed methods is something that it's not easy to do. People have entire lifetimes spent on one method and now you're asking them to do two. Um, but there are ways to kind of resolve philosophical differences, methodological differences, and build projects that can incorporate these. Um, Desmond Patton and colleagues have some really great work on qualitative analysis of social media data for gang-involved youth here in Chicago. Uh, that's something I look to. I gave the example um, earlier in references of Cardozo et al, who took a machine learning classifier for breast cancer, right? So in 2002, the model was developed, worked perfectly, it does way better than clinicians. But in 2014, they actually tested it and what they found is that if you relied on the machine learning model, you would actually do worse. You would give chemo unnecessarily. But comparing it to traditional clinical diagnoses, you could use it as a second pass to catch false positives. Um, and again, in my draft, I kind of talk about this more, uh, but that's, I think, a good example. Yes, we should understand the causal pathways of these genes to breast cancer, but that's not a bad way of using machine learning. So we can immediately take action, but we should do careful experimental testing of um, things in an out of sample setting in order to know whether it really works. Cross-validation will always show things working because you can always fit if you try hard enough. Um, and that's it. The other um, slides are just further references and you can check those out online. Thank you. Oh.